Okay. Yep. All good. There we go. So, um, well, good afternoon, everyone. Yes, I'm Andrew Hogg from the School of Mathematics in Bristol. And actually, you can see Bristol in the top corner of this slide. And there's a rather grand um, kind of tower. And that's right in the center of the university. And our building is just tucked in behind that. So it's a beautiful day here in Bristol. <laughs> and I'm very happy to be uh, speaking to you this afternoon. And this work's done with uh, some colleagues in Bristol, Mark Woodhouse and Jerry Phillips. And they're in the Earth Science Department. And then Ed Hinton, who is now in Melbourne. So I'm going to start by showing you a, a little uh, cartoon produced by the US Geological Service uh, of all kinds of volcanic hazards that you might encounter. Um, this ranges from the explosive eruptions, which might generate uh, ash clouds that go up into the atmosphere, they then get blown around and they fall out as a tephra, as uh, ash particles onto the uh, surroundings or it might generate these uh, very fast moving pyroclastic flows, which don't become buoyant, but propagate um, uh, down the hill and um, uh, move as density driven flows. Or you might have very rather more slowly moving lava flows, which are really flows of uh, molten rock. And so uh, the kind of volcanic systems is, um, poses a lot of large scale and uh, multi-phase hazards. And really, you could spend several careers, and people have spent several careers, <laughs> trying to understand these flows and um, trying to assess the hazards that they pose both to lives and, and livelihoods. So um, what I want to do today is speak about two different hazards. And the first is all to do with volcanic plumes. And so here I'm thinking about explosive eruptions, which send um, uh, hot particles into the atmosphere, they heat the surrounding air and the thing takes off and uh, ascends into the high atmosphere. On the left, you see a picture from uh, Mount St. Helens, the famous eruption from 1980, which went 20 kilometers into, into the atmosphere. And uh, recently in Bristol, our particular interest in these airborne plumes has been the hazard that they pose to aviation. So in particular, why can't you fly when there's uh, ash eruptions happening? And then the second problem I want to speak about um, is all a uh, very different um, uh, setting and it's lava flows. So these are these slow moving flows that uh, flow down the hillside flows, which are essentially viscously controlled of uh, molten rock. And the image you see at the bottom, and hopefully I'll get to explain what that is, that's something that a local artist produced. We had a collaboration uh, two years ago and, that's, um, and we'll get to what, what he's showing there. So then let's start then with uh, volcanic hazards and the risk to aviation. And here's some rather dramatic uh, photos of planes which are covered in volcanic ash. And these ones are ones which have not taken off, they're on the ground. And you can see the ash fall has been sufficient that they, well, it's caused one of them to sit down on, <laughs> on its back, that's the one on the right, and the other one is, has quite a layering. But actually that's not the problem I'm interested in. The problem I want to speak about is um, when the uh, aircraft is in the atmosphere and flying. And it turns out, whenever you take a flight, an assessment has to be made of whether there is any ash in the atmosphere and whether that uh, poses a risk to the aircraft flight. And it turns out that the world is divided into nine patches and each patch is advised by a volcanic ash advisory center. VAAC, a VAC as they're known, which provide information to the airlines um, on the safety of proposed flight paths. So here's how the world is divided, very unequally, and I think this is just a historical reason. And so here are the nine VACs, and it shows the area for which they have responsibility. So for first of all, um, the problem I'm going to speak about uh, is all to do with Iceland's in uh, volcanoes in Iceland. So Iceland is up here, and that's looked after by VAC London. And I'm going to speak about an eruption which occurred about 10 years ago and affected a lot of uh, flights in Northern Europe and flights from Northern Europe across into North America. Uh, you can see that where you are, VAC Toulouse has a huge job. So they have to monitor and report of all, on all of the volcanoes which occur within their patch. 
I've no idea where they're, why their area is so big, but that's how these things were carved up historically. In fact, the VAC, the Volcanic Ash Advisory Center, which is busiest, is the one down in Darwin. So down here in Australia, and they're monitoring and reporting on all of the Indonesian volcanoes. And pretty much all the time, there's uh, something erupting in Indonesia. And so they really are very active all of the time, trying to monitor and report to airlines what is happening. OK, so anyway, um, what I want to do today is speak about the 2010 eruption in Iceland of Eyjafjallajökull. Difficult to say for an English speaker, but that's the name of the volcano we're going to speak about. And it's a volcano just in the south of Iceland, in the southern tip. It's actually um, quite a small volcano, much smaller than um, surrounding ones. Um, Katla is quite close to it, Hekla, and these are both active and much bigger, but it was Eyjafjallajökull, which erupted in 2010. Okay, and Iceland has so many um, active volcanoes because the mid-ocean, mid-Atlantic ridge kind of passes through the island. And so there are eruptions which are explosive in St. Ash Cloud, or there's lots of eruptions which send out molten rock lava. So here is the eruption in 2010. A colleague of mine, Susanna Jenkins, just happened to be on the island at the time. And this is in the early days of its erupting. And she's about, she took this photo about 30 or 40 kilometers from the summit. And so you can see that a, a plume is sent up and the wind systematically blows the uh, plume over. We can see this plume from a satellite photo. So just to get your bearings here, you can just about pick out the coastline of Iceland. If I move my mouse, I hope that's coming out as well. So you can see what I'm pointing Yes, it does. Um... Excellent. Uh, and then you can see there's the volcano and it's sending this ash plume, this kind of dirty gray color plume, which is being blown southwards from uh, Iceland and is drifting towards Northern, Northern Europe. Well, now it was this ash plume which caused all the trouble. First of all, the event lasted quite a long time, about six weeks or so um, in April to May, 2010. And the problem was that at the time, the forecasters, and in particular those within those volcanic ash advisory centers, didn't really know how to um, predict the way in which this plume would behave or the concentration of ash that you would find within it. And so they erred quite rightly on the side of safety and they canceled all flights. And they canceled all flights for about six weeks. Uh, and that left a number of people stuck in the wrong place. Um, uh, you speak to people and some people were very happy because they were stuck on holiday and couldn't get home. <laughs> and some people were stuck working in the wrong place. Uh, midway through the crisis, originally the guidance was that if there was any ash in the atmosphere, you were not allowed to fly. They changed the regulations so that if there was, a, there was a threshold of ash, two milligrams per cubic meter, that's a very low concentration. But if the ash concentration was less than that, flying was deemed safe. But it was, if it was greater than that, uh, it was deemed unsafe and you couldn't fly. Well, now, of course, having a concentration now totally changes the calculation that you need to make because you need to predict how many particles are being put up into the atmosphere. And then how are they being moved around by the winds? And where is the ash cloud drifting to? So that's a much harder calculation. Uh, at the time, it was thought that maybe uh, these air flight Airspace closure cost about uh, 5 billion. OK. So here's the question. How can you measure how many particles are being put into the atmosphere by a volcano? So uh, here's a little sketch of an eruption. And I'm denoting by this capital Q the kind of rate at which we're putting mass in. So the volcano is producing a whole load of ash. It's heating the air. It's ascending. And we would like to know how many particles per unit time, per unit area, is the volcano putting into the atmosphere? And then that concentration is being blown around uh, by winds, and that's um, a second dispersion calculation we can make afterwards. But we could, this is kind of all about assessing the source conditions. Well, here's a difficulty. You can't measure anything directly. Anything you might put in the way of the flow would be destroyed. You know, I mean, um, the, the conditions close to the vent of these eruptions are quite extreme. However, one thing you can measure, and can measure quite accurately through various ways, is how high does the uh, plume rise? 
Uh, and you can measure that either uh, from satellite data or some people have ground-based observations. So in Iceland, they were able to fire up ground-based radar uh, at the cloud and look at the reflected single, signal and work out how high it was. So we can measure the height. And so how can we relate the height of rise to the source flux? So now I'm going to have a little cartoon on the right of my slide here, which hopefully will kind of explain the, the main point. So here we have a height here. And on the horizontal axis, we've got density. And what we know in the atmosphere is that the density decreases with height. That's just the density of the air. So that's this black line, the environmental density, rho E. So the volcano produces uh, a cloud, which is less dense than the surroundings. So I'm denoting that by the density at the source. So it's lower than the atmospheric density. And because it's lower, the cloud wants to go up. So if the cloud ascended as a hot air balloon, independently of its surroundings, or well, what would happen? Well, it wouldn't mix at all, and it would go up until its density matches the environmental density. And then it might oscillate around that point. Of course, that's not what plumes do. You can see from this uh, photo that the flow that is generated is pretty turbulent. And a key feature of this turbulence is that the, there is mixing between the air and the volcanic uh, eruption itself. And so what that means is that the fluid that's released from the source mixes with the environmental fluid. And so its density, the density coming from the volcano, progressively increases with height just due to this mixing. Okay, so it won't go as high as if there were no mixing. Now then, this problem without wind has been fairly well understood. But what has been more recently uh, established is that if there is wind, this rate of mixing is increased. And so what it means is that the plume mixes more rapidly with the surroundings, and so it doesn't reach as high before it becomes of the same density. Okay. And what I want to run through quickly is some models for how we can go about exploring that and its implications. Okay. So we've got to go back in history to think of a, an old uh, paper, which is uh, exploring plume dynamics. And this is a paper from 1956 by Morton, Taylor and Turner. Uh, here's photos of Morton, Turner and Taylor. Uh, Taylor was the uh, senior author. It was done as Morton and Turner as their uh, graduate uh, projects as graduate students. And what they looked at was models in the laboratories of plumes. So here's a laboratory photo of a, a buoyant source rising through a less, uh, less dense environment. So you see it rises and it mixes with its environment. And then they also formulated um, a simple integral model to predict the properties of this rise. So what I want to do is just quickly uh, tell you or maybe remind you of these plume models and how they work. So the key feature is that the flow is turbulent and it's the turbulent eddies which are responsible for the mixing. And so uh, I'm depicting in green the kind of edge of the plume. Well, we can't model all the turbulent features, but we can model the average. And we saw in the photos that these, these, thing, these plumes are approximately conically shaped. And so what we imagine is we're going to have something of a circular cross section at each elevation. And we're going to try and work out how the radius B of Z varies. And we have the vertical velocity. Uh, and the other key feature is that there must be some entrainment, some rate at which it's mixing. So our model is going to be about vertical velocity, the radius, and the density. We know the density of the plume changes as it rises due to mixing. In fact, we won't deal with density. We'll deal with a quantity known as the reduced gravity, which is really just the density difference times gravity normalized by density. OK, so how do these models work? So first of all, we write down an expression of mass conservation. And the idea is this. Imagine uh, a thin slice. And so we look at the mass flux into this slice and the mass flux leaving the slice. So the, that's pi b squared w. And so the difference between the top and the bottom is balanced by the rate at which fluid is entrained at the edges. And so that's where we pick in the dependence on this entrainment velocity. 
Okay. For our momentum equation, this time we have to think not of the mass flux into our little layer, but the momentum flux. So it's pi b squared w times w. And that's going to be balanced by um, the gravitational force, which is b squared times g prime. And then the final expression we have is it's called the buoyancy equation. And really, this is just telling us how the density field evolves. So it's saying that the fluid has some density rho. And its rate of change is balanced by the entrainment of environmental density. Well, rather than writing in terms of density, we write it in terms of this reduced gravity. And when we do that, we end up with this term, the rate of change of pi b squared g prime w, and that's the rate of, we call that the buoyancy flux. And that's balanced on the right-hand side by a term which is proportional to the rate at which the um, atmosphere varies, the density of the atmosphere varies with height. And that's known as the uh, buoyancy frequency of the atmosphere. Okay, so that's a simple model due to Morton, Taylor and Turner in 1956 for the mass, the momentum, the buoyancy. But we can't yet solve it. There's one key assumption I need to mention to you and that's how do you set the entrainment velocity? And this was their key insight that it must be proportional to the vertical velocity with some entrainment constant, which they would then measure it experimentally. And the justification for this is one of dimensional analysis in that there's no other velocity scale around. And so the uh, entrainment velocity must be proportional to the uh, velocity of motion. And they measured this entrainment constant in the laboratory as about 0.1. And many people have measured it since and found always found values quite close to 0.1. Okay, so let's see how these um, equations behave. So the simplest problem we can do is flow in a uniform environment. So that's when uh, rho e doesn't vary. Just back to my equations. If rho, if uh, n squared is zero, you can see that then tells us that pi b squared g prime w must just be a constant because we have zero on the right-hand side. And so we say that's a buoyancy flux and that's a constant. And if at the source we make the mass and momentum fluxes, that's b squared w squared and b squared w tends to zero, what do we find? Well, buoyancy flux is constant. And then these are the solutions to the equations. b squared times w, that we call that the volume flux. It's given by this expression, f zero to the one third, z to the five thirds. And the momentum flux goes like f zero to the two thirds, z to the four thirds. And you might note, I've uh, written these expressions and in the red, I've written the dimensional factors. And then in black, we have some constants. And actually, you can, if you just use dimensional analysis, you'd be able to deduce the red factors. And then by solving the equations, you'd be able to work out precisely what these factors are. Okay, so if we've got M and Q specified, we can then work out well, what's the effective radius well, that's just q squared divided by m. And when we do that, we find that the radius under this model is proportional to the, the, the height. And so indeed, this predicts plumes, which are conical shaped. Okay. And uh, this is a picture of an oil fire, which shows, satisfies that properly. Okay, so that's if the atmosphere is not stratified. If the atmosphere is stratified, then the situation changes a little. And so let's deal with a constant stratification. So now we have two dimensional parameters, the buoyancy frequency, this quantity n, which is the rate of change of the atmospheric density with height, and the buoyancy flux. And here I write down their dimensions. And so between them, we can identify a length scale and a time scale. And so if we ask how high does this plume reach. Well, the only way we can get a height scale from these two quantities is this first one through this length scale. And so the height of rise must be proportional to the buoyancy flux times the inverse cube of the buoyancy frequency all to the one quarter power. Well, now, if we solve our governing equations, that's what I've done in the right hand uh, picture. And you can see this is how the quantities evolve. Note there's two key points. G 
G prime, remember, me measures the density difference between the plume and the surroundings, and that passes through zero at some height. And then the plume continues to rise a little bit further because it's got inertia. So it can, continues going up and eventually stops going up at the inertial layer of the sheet. Okay. But the key idea is that dimensional analysis tells you that the height of rise is proportional to the buoyancy flux to the one quarter times the buoyancy frequency to the minus three quarters. Okay, so now back to um, plumes and volcanic plumes. So this is what was known in, um, and what was done in 2010. And essentially it's curve fitting. So here is a collection of data where people have measured the rate at which the volcano was producing ash and how high its plume went. And they've had to work very hard, of course, to work out this rate of ash production because it involves going to the eruption afterwards and sampling and estimating how much ash came out. But yeah, here's the, here's the data set. Uh, and what people did was to fit best fit curves through this data set. And there's two versions, a red version, which was due to Steve Sparks and others, and a blue version, which is due to Larry Mastin. And of course, they're very close to each other. Um, now, of course, this samples all volcanoes. And what we did was to go through this data individually and try and work out how strong was the wind in each setting. And so we've colored the points according to this color scale. And we did this by doing kind of reanalysis data. So running an atmospheric model uh, to deduce wind speeds at the time of the eruptions. And so we can see there is some, some, some systematic deviation due to wind. And so we might expect that wind might uh, cause this empirical relationship not to hold so well. But what's notable is that um, our dimensional analysis would say that the height of rise must go like the buoyancy flux to the one quarter. And that's more or less what both of the empirical functions were saying, these curve fitting. You know, these, these powers are pretty close to a one quarter power. Okay. And so back in 2010, when EFYOKO was erupting, uh, what was done was people measured how high the plume went and then read off what the source flux was. And then use that as a, hammer, as a measure of how the rate at which the volcano was injecting ash into the atmosphere. Okay, so now I want to move on and tell you um, about what happens when the wind blows. And the idea here is that uh, you now have to change your plume model a little bit. And of course, what happens is the plume gets tilted over. And so now, rather than just thinking about vertical momentum, we have to think about horizontal momentum as well. So we have, um, I've changed the notation here deliberately. So R is now the perpendicular radius of this, uh, of this uh, plume. And so we have an expression for conservation of mass. That's uh, identical to what we had before. Then we have both vertical and horizontal momentum. Okay, so there's an extra momentum equation. And then rather than the buoyancy equation, we have to write down an, it's essentially an energy equation. So it accounts for the energy transport um, due to the hot particles and it's mixing with the environment. So we now have four rather than three governing equations. And here's the uh, key idea that um, the rate at which the mixing occurs, the entrainment, now has something to do with the wind as well. So there's not just a single velocity scale, there's now a wind scale as well. And so we have to allow for an extra, uh, we have to parameterize the effect of the wind, which we do, we write in this way at the bottom here. And this entrainment velocity, this has been tested by um, um, experiments within wind tunnels and things like that. It was available in the 1980s. Okay, so that's how we uh, formulate a model for a steady wind blown volcanic plume. So does it work? So here we are, what we're doing is we've got a model for the atmosphere. And so we know how the buoyancy is varying within the atmosphere and we prescribe a standard variation of the wind speed. Basically there's a linear shear up to the tropopause, up to 10 and a bit kilometers. And then it's a plug flow after that. And when we run our model, we find these collection of these red dotted lines, uh, red, red dots. And there it's, it's individual points rather than a curve because we're 
systematically varying over parameters in the model that where, where we're not 100% certain of their values. But we get a trend. And when we have no wind speed, essentially we go pretty close to the empirical codes. So what happens then as we increase the wind speed? Well, here we are, we systematically increase through 10, 20, 30, and 40 meters per second. And you could see that the plume for a given source flux, the plume doesn't rise as high. And that's because the wind promotes mixing. And so the plume loses its buoyancy more quickly. OK, so that's how the model works. So let's see what we can learn from looking at uh, data. So I'm going to now talk again about the Icelandic plume, Eyjafjallajökull, in its early stages of eruption. And so these are the measured plume heights. And so these, I think, were measured with a radar, which they fired up and looked at the reflection. That's how they reduced these signals. So essentially, the plume was up at about eight or nine kilometers uh, on the 14th of April. Then overnight, it dropped to six kilometers. And then it did a bit of variation. And then it was back up um, uh, eight or nine kilometers again. Well, now. If you've got the measured plume height, you could use the empirical curves to um, work out well what is the mass, what's the mass flux, how many particles are being injected into the atmosphere. And you can do that and you can see, well, perhaps the minimum value is just less than 10 to the 5, and the maximum value is 10 to the 6 or so. And then we could use that information and put it into an atmospheric dispersion model and work out where the um, how the concentration of ash in the atmosphere changes. However, this inferred mass flux is all based on these empirical correlations which take no account of the wind speed. And so what we want to do is use our model to see uh, what uh, the implication would be. Also, something strange is happening here. You know, the, the volcano in the middle of the night is suddenly changing. It's, it's source flux, and it, certainly it could do, but maybe there's other ways of explaining that uh, abrupt variation. So here's some other data. And of course, what happened is that the wind speed changed. And so um, there was initially fairly low wind, that's the data in this top panel, coinciding with when the plume was rising quite high. And then there was a period where it blew, the wind blew much more strongly for a couple of days, and then the wind speed dropped again. And these transitions in wind speed correspond quite nicely with the uh, changes in the plume height. And so our hypothesis is that actually the, the volcano was behaving in a fairly uniform way. And what was happening was the wind was changing, and that was affecting how high the plume, right? Uh, how high the plume went. So, what does that mean in terms of working out what the source flux was? So, we can now run our model, and we can um, um, uh, what we do in this data. We uh, make sure we hit the data. We we adjust all our parameters so which we correctly predict the first measurements, and thereafter we just allow for the wind variation, the measured wind variation. And that then produces these estimates of what the source flux is. And you can see under our windy model, the volcano was behaving in a fairly constant way. It wasn't going through these abrupt changes. And importantly, the source flux was about 10 to the 7, close to 10 to the 7. And so this is an important consequence that actually that's 100 times greater than if we just used the um, uh, empirical formulae. And so that's really uh, the first uh, point I want to make about um, uh, assessing this hazard, that it's important to account for the wind, and that has potentially a, fa uh, a factor of up to 100 times um, uh, its effect. You could miss, in this situation, you could underestimate the source strength by a factor of 100. OK. Right. So now here is actually um, a little movie of the eruption itself. This was captured from um, a mobile phone company had installed a webcam, which was just pointing up at the mountains. 
and uh, very fortunately it wasn't cloudy <laughs> and uh, they were able to capture this footage of the uh, volcano. And what we see is that whilst um, you certainly could take averages and treat this as a steady eruption, maybe there are some variations that we ought to be bothered about. And so what I want to speak about now is how might you form a model for an unsteady plume? Remember, Taylor Turner, Morton Taylor and Turner's model was all for a steady plume. So let's see, how do, how do things change? Well, there were some experiments done um, about 15 years ago by Scase, Caulfield and DL in Cambridge. And what they did was they fired a plume off, let it get itself established, it was nice and conical, and then they changed abruptly the source strength. And that's these photos. These are rather difficult to interpret. So let me draw a line along the edge. So we know when the plume is fully established, it, it has a conical shape. Its radius increases linearly with height. And that's what you see in this green curve initially. They then reduced the source strength. And what we see is that the plume kind of necks in. There's this zone of adjustment, which gets advected through uh, the domain. And then eventually you've got a stronger, you've got a stronger plume, but it returns to being conical again, just increasing with radius. So there's an adjustment between two steady states. And we'd like to have a model which could cope with that situation. So what might a model like that look like? So um, I'm not gonna speak about the presence of wind. We're just gonna think about um, a wind-free situation. And so we have our three equations, mass, momentum, and buoyancy. And these are the steady equations which Morton, Taylor, and Turner formulated. And what we want to do is add terms to it which would represent the unsteadiness. So the most natural way to do it would be to add terms like this. So the first equation then will be telling you about the evolution of B squared, or essentially the cross-sectional radius of the plume which then gets carried with velocity w. And the next one tells you about the momentum, which has this momentum flux, and then similarly for the buoyancy. So this is the most natural generalization to an unsteady situation of our principles of mass, momentum, and buoyancy. And so what we did was to, um, uh, these equations have been around maybe 15 years or so. And so we took them and tried to simulate this abrupt change of buoyancy at the source. And here's our numerical results. So we had initially one steady state with the radius increasing linearly, and then we made a change. And here's some snapshots at time. And you can see that quite nicely, the width is decreasing as there's a kind of adjustment pulse which passes through. But there's a very serious problem, and that we're getting this issue in our numerical computation, these kind of wobbles, which as we increase the resolution, these become worse. And that's not good, right? It's suggesting that this model has something pathological in it. And our solutions that we're computing depend on how fine your grid is, and that can't be right. Okay, so it tells you something's wrong with the model. And that's what I want to speak about for the next five minutes or so. Okay. So what is wrong with this model? So what we need to do is go back and think, actually, what are we writing down when we write down the momentum conservation? So really what we're doing is, let me just flick back to what we had. We'd written it as b squared w d by dt plus d by dz of b squared w squared. But really what that is, is a representation of, a, of an integral over the cross-sectional area. So really we're integrating W over our cross-sectional area. And here we're integrating W squared. Well, we write the first term just in terms of an average velocity. That defines the average. But this second term, we're trying to average W squared. And the, inter and the average of W squared is not the same as the square of the average of W. And we can see that in that we, if we subtract uh, this term uh, from uh, the, the second term from this first term, we can see that it must be something which is positive. And so that tells us this S, this shape factor, as some people call it, has to be 
at least bigger than one. Well, now let's go back to our model. So our models end up featuring this shape factor. And the model that went wrong had the shape factor being one. And what we've just shown is that the shape factor must be at least bigger than one. So that seemed a very minor difference, but is that enough to account for uh, the problems that we were having in our computations? And of course, the answer is going to be yes, or I wouldn't be telling you about it, but here we go. So we have to do some mathematical analysis of this system, and we look for the characteristics of the system. Okay, and when we do that, we find we have three characteristics, uh, which have speed w, or w times s plus or minus s squared minus s. And so what we can see is that when the shape factor is bigger than one, these characteristics are all distinct. And so the system is hyperbolic. When s equal one, all of our characteristic speeds are the same. And so that tells us that the system is degenerate and parabolic. So this very small change is changing the nature of our mathematical system. And it's going to turn out that that's enough to explain the pathology we were seeing before. So how do we do it? I'm going to actually whiz through this rather quickly because I don't think really this is the time to go through a lot of mathematics. But what we can do is um, take our steady solution where the, you might recall the volume flux went like z to the 5 thirds and the um, uh, mass flux, flux uh, sorry, that, that should say momentum flux went like z to the four thirds and the buoyancy flux was constant. And we're going to perturb it. And we're going to imagine that our source is varying like um, cos omega t. And then we ask, well, what does the far field look like? And when you do that with s being one, you find that the far field grows exponentially, like the square root of this quantity, which I've called x. And worse than that, it's high frequency perturbations grow more rapidly than low frequency perturbations. And this means that the system is mathematically ill-posed. And ill-posed systems even cannot be solved numerically. They just don't make sense, right? You can't find grid resolved uh, solutions. And so that's really the problems that we were saying. So now the question, what happens? So we've seen that we've got a problem if our shape factor is equal to one, but what happens if we put it to some value bigger than one. So in this uh, slide, I've chosen two values, a value close to one in the left-hand panel or a value a bit bigger than one in the right-hand panel. And I'm computing the solution. And what I'm doing at, at the source, I'm just making the source flux vary. So I'm making it one plus or minus something which is varying like sine 4t with a small amplitude. So you can see this right at the bottom, this is varying like sine t in both panels. In the left-hand one, when the shape factor is very close to one, you can see that the amplitude of our, var of our variations is growing. It starts at 0.1 amplitude here, and it grows to something greater. In the right-hand panel, you can see that it's diminishing. And what we can do through some analysis is find that um, this system is linearly unstable when S lies between one and 25 over 24. Uh, but it's linearly stable if it's bigger than 25 over 24. And just to show you what that does in terms of the width, um, this is the same. So the right-hand one is unstable. And so when we make these oscillations at the source, you can see that the width develops perturbations which grow with distance. Uh, in the right-hand panel, so that's the left-hand panel, in the right-hand panel, you can see that there are oscillations on that curve but they're uh, really very small and diminishing. And so what this does now is it sets us up so which we can now, if we choose our shape factor to be bigger than 25 over 24, we have a system which is mathematically well posed uh, and which is linearly stable. And so that's a system in which we can now make unsteady calculations. And uh, what I wanna do is just very quickly illustrate um, uh, two uh, calculations for you. Uh, and what we're going to do is make an instantaneous change of buoyancy flux, just as they did in the experiments. What we know is that independent of buoyancy flux, the steady state has a constant uniform, uh, the width varies linearly with Z. Uh, and we want to see how that emerges uh, from our uh, simulations. 
And this is a technical note that because the system of governing equations is hyperbolic, you could have solutions with shocks. And so we need to worry ourselves about jump conditions which would apply across discontinuities. Okay, let me show you the results. So on the right hand, I'm going to show you um, what happens if we were to decrease the buoyancy flux. Remember, this is what they did in the experiment. So in this simulation, we're going to start at a buoyancy flux of one, that's F being one, and we're going to decrease to F being one twentieth. Okay. So what you can see is that there's a pulse over which this adjustment takes place, and the plume narrows during that um, transition. Okay, and eventually this pulse is carried out of the domain and you're going back to having the width varying linearly with height. Okay, now we're going to do the opposite. We're going to increase our buoyancy flux from one. I think we increase it up to about five. And what we see here is something rather different. We see now that the width of the buoyancy, or width of the plume increases. So there's a kind of bulge which gets carried through the system as the new steady state is established. Okay, so, so if we decrease the buoyancy flux, uh, the plume narrows as it adjusts to the uh, reduced source buoyancy. And if we increase it, we get this uh, broadening as it increases the new buoyancy flux. Okay, and this adjustment takes pl place as a similarity solution. And, uh, um, and so we can fully understand this adjustment. But the point is we now have a way of writing down a well-posed model for unsteady plumes. Okay, and so what else I want to say now, I'm going to change tack in my last uh, few minutes and speak about a different type of volcanic hazard. So this is going to be all about volcanic lava. And actually, um, uh, just before Christmas, um, in, on the Canary Islands, La Palma, there was a, a fairly long-lived eruption which produced lots of lava. It produced some ash as well, but lava were the, was the um, main effects. Uh, the Canary Islands, as you see, they're 1,700 kilometers from Madrid, just off of the west of Africa. And so here's a rather nice photo of lava flows coming down the hillside and flowing around kind of topographic mounds. And so lava flows fairly slowly and as a fairly shallow layer, it has a very high viscosity. It's driven by gravity, so it flows downhill predominantly, but it's guided by topography. And it also interacts with infrastructure, so you might build things in the way of it to try and deflect it. And here you can see there's a house which had a very lucky escape, right? So uh, this photo is a bit dark, but you can see in black, well, this is the lava flow, which has completely surrounded uh, the mound on which this house is based. Okay, so what we would like to do is understand this deflection. And we're going to take the simplest possible model we can, which is to model the flowing layer as a viscously dominated shallow layer. And what we'd like to determine is the flow depth as a function of two horizontal coordinates and time. So a quick word on the mathematical model. So we're going to look at the flow over topography. Uh, X is going to be the coordinate down the plane. Z is perpendicular to the plane and Y is uh, perpendicular in, within the plane. The flows flow under hydrostatic pressure. That means that they're parallel with the underlying boundary. There's no, no appreciable vertical acceleration. And the shallow flow, uh, the shallow layer flow in the lubrication regime, where we balance the viscous stresses with the pressure gradient and the gravitational forcing. And from that, we can work out the volume flux. Uh, which is the rate of transport in the downflow direction in the x direction and in the crossflow direction in the y direction. And these fluxes under this viscous model uh, depend on h cubed, the sign of the inclination, beta is the inclination of the plane, and gradients of the height and of the topography. And so our final model, we use global mass conservation to say dh by dt is balanced by the divergence of this volume flux. And then we want to get a dimensionless description. And so the convenient length scale is the upstream thickness. So the, we imagine a situation where the flow is generating a uniform sheet carrying a certain volume flux, and that sets the thickness of the layer, h infinity. And then 
if we flow over some topography, there's some kind of natural length scale of the topography, some kind of um, uh, uh, domain over which uh, uh, it's non-zero. So we put all this together and we look in the steady state, and here's our dimensionless governing equation. On the left-hand side, we have a flow, we have a term which is all because you're flowing downhill. And on the right-hand side, you have terms which are due to how variations in flow thickness cause you to move and how variations in topography cause you to move. And we have two dimensionless parameters, our capital F here, uh, which measures the thickness of the upstream flow to something to do with the width of the topography, and M, which measures how high the topography is. So I'm going to show you some solutions to this model. And what we're going to do is uh, just have a mound, which is got a kind of Gaussian structure. And we're going to imagine flow down a hill and around this mound. And we compute these solutions uh, numerically. Uh, so here are two solutions. I'm only showing one half of them because they're symmetrical about the line y equals zero. So let's look at the top one, first of all. This is a fairly small mound. And in this case, the flow can go over the top and it can go around the edges. Uh, and so we see that there's a, uh, the cross marks where we get the maximum flow thickness and the triangle where we get the minimum flow thickness. So the flow gets deflected around and thins as it goes over the top. When you go to a larger mound, what you find is the flow can no longer go over the top of it it all gets deflected around the edges. And so you get the creation of a dry zone, some kind of zone here into which no fluid flows. Okay, well, we'd like to uh, investigate this and I'm showing you some images now for, of some experiments we did. And rather than having a smoothly varying topography, that's quite difficult to do in the laboratory. What we introduced was some surface piercing obstacles. So these were sufficiently high that they uh, came out of the, um, they were larger than the flow depth. And so here you can see, we've got a photo of a circular cylinder that we had as some flow going around it. And then the left-hand side, we have a square uh, cylinder and you can see um, um, a movie of the experimental images as the flow comes from uphill on the left-hand side and flows downhill. And note that it's leaving this dry zone behind. The fluids here are very viscous, the um, thick syrups and oils. In the right-hand side, you can also see there's a dry zone behind uh, the cylinder. And you can see the flow is at its thickest on the upstream side. So it's developed this rather deep upstream kind of pond or pool of material and a dry zone down, uh, down, down slope. And so we're particularly interested in what sets the depth in this upstream region and when do you get the downstream uh, uh, fluid free zone. So let's have a look at our model. So in this case, we have it's uh, the steady equation we had before. This time there is no topography. So we just have the flow equation and the kind of uh, and the downstream term. And we have to solve this equation subject to having a depth of one h infinity when you go far away from the object. And you then have to make this impermeable, which means we have no normal flow into it. And so here's a numerical solution. Uh, this is contours of depth, and it has exactly the character we were anticipating. As the flow gets deflected around here, it builds its greatest depths upstream and its smallest depths downstream. And in this setting, with f equal one, I guess it's about 1.6 upstream and about 0.4 downstream. Okay. And so here's a, a, just a plot of um, how the height varies. So I'm coming along this axis approaching the cylinder and it's going from H infinity. And then as you approach the cylinder, it's reaching some maximum height. And for this value of our flow parameter, the height has more than trebled. And so we can compare with experiments. Our uh, Hmax, that's these data here, and uh, the Hmin, that's uh, uh, the data here. And it, the theory compares with experiments quite well. But what's really intriguing is how this maximum height 
really grows when our flow parameter becomes small. And remember, our flow parameter was measuring the thickness of the flow relative to the extent of our, of our object. And, that's, and so for natural settings, that's going to be a very small parameter. And that's the regime that we're interested in. Can we understand this growth of H max as F diminishes? And the answer is yes, we can. And what you have to do is break up uh, the regime into three parts. So you have a kind of uniform bit that's coming towards it with depth one. Adjacent to the cylinder, the flow is just deflected. But you also have this rather tricky region in which it gets decelerated first. So flow that's approaching the cylinder gets decelerated and then deflected. And you can put together a matched asymptotic expansion, expansion which has three regions, and you, and you can get all of these to match together and to work out. out. And it's rather tricky, actually, because you have to handle uh, three regions. But in fact, there's a much more uh, easy way of doing it. Um, and perhaps in the interest of time, I won't, I won't even run through this. But what I can say is uh, we can deduce it basically by balancing volume fluxes. We know how much fluid is coming in, and we can work out how much gets deflected. And that then enables us to work out how deep the fluid must become. So I'm going to skip a slide and not show you it. I'm going to give you some results. And what we find is that there's different results depending on the shape of the object. So for circles, we have this first expression where it goes inversely proportional to the flow parameter of the one quarter. Squares, we have flow parameter to the two fifths. And then diamonds, we have something more complicated. Um, no longer do you get the deepest flow on the axis, but the position of deepest flow moves progressively to the, um, to the um, edge of the diamond there. And we can work out all of these out asymptotically. And really what it's feeling is when it impacts the um, object, what's the radius of, radius of curvature? And it's that which is setting these, these dependencies. Okay, so that was rather rapid, I'm afraid. And what we'd really like to do now is compare some of this, uh, these models to these observations of flow around topography. We acknowledge, of course, that you know, just treating the lava as a simple viscous fluid is quite a gross approximation. And there's much better models that we ought to think about doing, perhaps including temperature dependence, perhaps including uh, solidification effects. But perhaps the viscous model uh, can tell you something. And that takes me to this image that I showed right at the start. And so this is a series of seven panels, which are large, actually. Each panel is oh, uh, two and a half meters by half a meter, and produced by this local artist in Bristol called Hugh Evans. And uh, he was work um, we had this initiative called Creative Reaction, artists working with mathematicians. And I was speaking to him about these viscous flows and how they get deflected around objects. And he became really interested in this uh, process. So if you look carefully, every other panel has um, uh, an object in. So this one has like a, a half a circle. This one has some kind of square device. And this one has an inverted U shape. And what he did was he put these in and then he poured paints down. And he became really interested uh, by the shapes of the deflections, uh, which was his representation <laughs> of the uh, calculations that uh, we've been making. OK, anyway, so let me summarize in a more scientific way. So here, this was the cartoon uh, I started right at the show, right at the start. And really, of all these many things, I've just spoken about perhaps two aspects, the eruption column and trying to understand the mixing and the rate at which ash gets delivered to the atmosphere. And then I've tried to say something about lava flow and its interaction with uh, obstacles. And there's one final thing I want to show you, and that's this. So um, our work on modeling plumes is something we've, we've made available online. And um, there's uh, this webpage, uh, plumerise.brist.ac.uk, which will solve the plume models for you. Uh, and so given a location, you can work out how high the plume will go, or you can do it in reverse. You can say, if I observe the plume being this high, how strong is the source? And um, we've been sharing this uh, computational tool with several of those volcanic ash advisory centers. And uh, some of them are now using uh, this approach to better estimate um, the, ash, uh, the ash, the risk to aviation 
of volcanic ash. And so next time, if you're on an airplane, you're very welcome to use this uh, tool. It's available for free. OK, and I'll stop there. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Andrew. This was a, a great talk. Uh, now we'll open for questions. So has anyone questions? No question? <laughs> okay, <laughs> so I'm going to ask question. <laughs> um, you showed for the Mont uh, two situations where, where the flow could uh, go over the Mont and the situation where the flow could not go over it. Yep. Uh, the, the one before, yeah, this one. Do you have a dimensionless number to tell us yes. when this is the case or not? Yes, yes, you do. Um, um, and in this case, I, uh, it's something like 1.176 or something, something like that. Of course, it depends a little bit on the shape that you use. So here, yeah. um, you, you know, we've, we've made our uh, shape uh, this, uh, this Gaussian. Axisymmetric, yeah. Yeah, an axisymmetric Gaussian. Um, and um, yeah, and, and so then actually the number that we get out, we, we can write it down. It's not just a decimal expression, it's, it's to do with exponentials in, in, okay. in some way. Uh, but of course, if you had a mound of a different shape, uh, you, you'd end up with a, a, a different criteria. But uh, what I would contend is that um, for uh, any shape, actually, in the end, there will be a critical height when the viscous flow will no longer be able to go over the top, but will be deflected okay. around it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say in any case, even if you have a, I mean, suppose you have different shapes, but you can average your length uh, or associate with that shape a, a characteristic length scale. And maybe that the axisymmetric case would be a good first order guess, no? Yes. Um, so what we did a little bit of um, was having. Um, something with a shape which was extended in the cross stream direction. So in the Y direction here. And what we were trying to do there was understand, um, you know, sometimes people build mounds to try and defend properties and things like that, right? Yeah. Um, and often they're not so long, but they're very wide. Um, yeah. And so uh, the way in which we were doing that was, uh, uh, we were amending our Gaussian to have a uh, coefficients multiplying uh, this y, y squared term just okay. to get it extended in the, in, in the y direction. Okay. Um, and part of our interest was that one thing you can do with this model is uh, once you know the fluid, uh, the distribution of the fluid height, so once you've uh, integrated to find the solution here, you can then work out what are the loading stresses on the object, on the um, on oh, the mound yeah, yeah, that you built. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, you have a contribution from uh, the pressure and then potentially you have viscous stresses as well. But those can be worked out. And so you can estimate uh, how, what you need to build your defense from, right? Have yeah. you built it strong enough to withstand the oncoming flow? That's very practical, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think we have a question now from Cynthia Ebinger. Uh, so, with the analog flow modeling, have you considered evaluation of the surface roughness versus lava viscosity? Some basaltic lavas, as in Rwanda, have very low viscosity, which mm. is Yes. Um, uh, no, we haven't thought about that. So, really, um, uh, here, here's our experiments. These were just uh, in the laboratory, and uh, we were using uh, in the left. Um, uh, a silicon oil, and in the right, we'd be just using golden syrup, actually. Um, yeah. So, uh, and, and the flows were over perspex. And so we assumed that uh, they were smooth yeah, and, and, and had a no slip condition at the base. But of course, mm -hmm. in natural settings, you know, when you have rough uh, terrains, then uh, yes, potentially you need to do something a bit better. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, as, is there any further question? Yeah, hi, Andrew. Thank you very much. That was a really a nice talk. I'm, uh, as as, uh, as uh, an ignorant in the field, I, I'm just wondering regarding the, the flows. I mean, if you consider at the same time both uh, 
depression and 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 sort of a hill or or a basin would would this make completely your picture different i guess right yeah uh, that's right so so actually putting a, a depression in you know kind of a little hole first is is something that that you can do to these models and in fact um something we have done but i'm not speaking about today and it does change things indeed yes so you can get situations it all depends how deep the how deep the depression is as actually as to uh, how uh, the effect goes you can you, you know if you're not very deep then essentially the flow doesn't notice it it has no effect but then you get a critical thickness a critical depth where it's actually got to fill it in properly uh, but, uh, before the flow can exit it so yes it does it, it does exert uh, a control yeah yeah. Oh, thank, thank you. Regarding the ash part, I mean, are you, do you consider also the fact that you're dealing with a, a plume that might be weak or a plume that might be strong? I mean, uh, how, how this would, would change the... Yeah, it, so, but, so I, as, actually... As an ignorant also, I mean, the, the, the volcanic cloud that, that grow over, over the whole system, would this affect during the, the growth stage the effect of the wind? Um, yeah, so actually, uh, the model, as we formulated it, um, can be run for any strength of plume. So, of course, if the plume is weak, it gets bent over straight away, right, and doesn't penetrate very high into the atmosphere. Um, whereas if the plume is strong, it ascends a long way and basically isn't really affected by wind very much. And so it essentially shoots up vertically. That's a bit like what Mount St. Helens did. That was a very powerful eruption and sent a, a plume which was basically unaffected by the wind until it had reached its maximum height. And then the material was just hanging around up in the atmosphere and then it got blown, um, uh, it got blown eastward across um, uh, North America. Um, so actually I think the, uh, the plume strength is kind of already built in uh, into, the, into these models, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, anyone? No. Okay, so I would have many questions, but it's not appropriate. So, <laughs> so we, we, we <laughs> um, yeah, maybe I'll ask just one, uh, just for fun, because I was wondering about, uh, I mean, we have this, uh, this effect of the entrainment, right? Uh, of uh, air into the plume. Uh, has anyone already looked at uh, the altitude itself of the volcanoes? Because whether the volcanoes is, is at sea level or at 3000 meters high, uh, obviously, the atmosphere will be very different, and that could, uh, yeah, change or yes. affect. Um, so I think the altitude is um, taken into account. So um, the height of rise is measured from um, the height of the crater. But what's not taken into account, and uh, maybe there's a, uh, maybe I'll just try and step back uh, very quickly. Yeah, that's exactly where I wanted to be. So uh, this is the empirical data. And what's not taken into account here is um, the latitude of the uh, volcano. So actually where in the world these volcanoes yeah, the are. Most, the moisture. Yeah, exactly so. So as you, you know, as you are, if you're within tropical regions, the buoyancy frequency is a bit different. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, very often um, the buoyancy frequency is less. And so eruptions would tend to shoot up to the tropopause almost automatically, right? I mean, yeah, because the atmosphere is on the edge of overturning. Uh, and that's not taken into account at all. You'll note these um, empirical correlations don't feature the buoyancy frequency. Mm. Uh, and of course they should, right? So these empirical uh, correlations are not, are dimensionally consistent, right? I mean, in other words, these numbers have a, you know, 0.2 must be in a certain- Yeah, they are unit, dimensional. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you, you could imagine that actually a better version would account for um, a better empirical relation would account for okay. the buoyancy frequency. Now, of course, when you run a mathematical model like the ones that, that, that we formulated, mm -hmm. you, you, you put in what the buoyancy frequency is. And so that does account for the, for the location. And the way we run um, uh, our plume rise 
uh, computational tool, the one I showed right at the end, is that actually you can read in um, um, the, the, the current uh, weather. Or, so you read in your <laughs> met observations, right? So you know what the wind speed is and okay. you know what the um, atmospheric stratification is. Uh, so actually what we have been doing with some uh, geophysics agencies is producing for them like a kind of a um, uh, daily hazard assessment plot. So yeah. you know, saying, given today's weather, mm. if you had an eruption of this strength, how high would it go? And so we can make calculations like that quite easily. And that yeah. might help uh, help them kind of uh, uh, work out hazard scenarios. Mm. Okay. And the plumes are, are considered uniform, like there is no particle or sedimentation of That's particles. Right. That's right. And there is no chemical reaction, um, which, which probably, I mean, I, I don't know, within the rise, it's probably, it's probably, I, I would assume it's okay. I mean, I would be more, uh, I mean, if it was about the lateral uh, propagation, I think that's more. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so yes, under our view, the rise velocities are much greater than the settling velocity of the particles. Yeah. And so they basically get carried up. And then once they're at height, they then get blown around by the, you know, so then it's no longer a plume, it's kind of like a cloud in the atmosphere. Mm. And so it gets blown around uh, by the atmospheric winds and settling can occur. Uh, this is actually back to um, uh, one of the, the... The first two. Yeah, yeah, the sketch, right? So, you know, the kind of plume has happened. You've then got this cloud that's been blown around uh, and you get ash settling out, of it, out from it. Mm. What you say about chemical reactions is interesting. Um, so a different version of a volcanic hazard is to not worry about the ash particles, but to worry about sulfur dioxide. Mm, yeah. So, you know, many plumes are, have a very high sulfur dioxide levels. Yeah. Um, and to model that, you need to accurately capture the um, kind of atmospheric chemistry of the sulfur. It's extremely complex. <laughs> yeah, indeed, <laughs> indeed. So it's, yeah, right. I'm very pleased to hear you say that because uh, that's exactly what we found, that it's very difficult to know even what are the key reactions or yeah, because are there I any think, estimates of the reaction rates, right? Like, yeah, the sulfuric acid has got many uh, reactions that can occur. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so actually um, that became a problem in Iceland uh, in, they had an eruption in 20, I'm going to say 2015, which lasted about a year. Mm -hmm. uh, it didn't produce any ash, really. It was a long fissure er uh, eruption, and it just produced loads of sulfur dioxide. Because of the prevailing winds, most of it got blown towards Norway, <laughs> yeah. uh, by which stage it was diluted quite a bit. But sometimes the winds blew the other direction and blew it back towards the population center in Reykjavik, which is basically where everyone lives. That's the capital city. Yeah. Yeah. And then they uh, invented a new term, which they would call VOG. So rather than fog, <laughs> they would call it VOG, volcanic yeah. fog. Uh, and it was affecting people's uh, respiration. People were feeling uncomfy because of the high levels of sulfur uh, 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 yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, so so actually, um, um, getting that problem sorted out, I think, would have very practical consequences. It would be, would be mm. very good to have. I think so. Yeah. Okay, so I'll uh, stop the recording.